Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Ben Rhodes. And I'm Jen Psaki. Welcome, Jen Psaki. It's great to be here. Live in Washington. I'm. Thank you for coming to the lovely town of Washington. I, I ba- all, back to Washington. Uh, yeah, and very few things get me here. I came all the way here to, to podcast with you because you are stepping in for Tommy. Uh, those of you who have not heard Pod Save America may not know, Tommy and his wife Hannah have a beautiful baby girl, Lizette. Everybody so is exciting. healthy, and it's so exciting, right? And she's beautiful. Hannah looks stunning, which most people do not look at like after they've had a baby. <laughs> Tommy, I'm sure, looked fine, but Tommy, congratulations sure fine. to them. Yeah, he's probably a wreck inside, but outside he looks great, and we're so happy for them. As, as those of you know, this was not easy, uh, and so this is a truly, truly happy thing. Um, we are going to talk about some happy things and, you know, some not so happy things. Um We'll talk about Brittany Griner uh, and her release in a very high-profile prisoner swap. Uh, a bit of an update on Ukraine, including why are there some additional U.S. troops going to Ukraine? Uh, so wait for that. Uh, a bit of an update on what's happening with the ongoing protests in Iran. Then we'll check in with this big summit that's happening here in Washington uh, with President Biden hosting leaders from across Africa. Uh, that also brings us to the World Cup, where Morocco is representing uh, all of Africa uh, in the semis that are upcoming. And we have further corruption scandals and corruption adjacent scandals in the European Parliament. And then we'll talk about a president in Peru who was pretty, you know, rising star and now is impeached and in police custody. And so we'll, we'll just, what the hell is going on there? It is short lived rise. Yeah, it was it was a it was a good ride while he could take it. And uh, and of course, we'll end on Harry and Meghan because that's what of we course, do right here. As May, one does. Maybe a little white lotus, Jen. I didn't prep you for that. Sure. Uh, I'm can, a little behind, but little we can behind? definitely okay. talk about it. OK, so we, we, we will talk about it either on or off air. Um, how are you doing, by the way? Uh, everybody, uh, I'm sure, knows and loves you, but w- what have you been up to? Not everybody, Ben. I think we know that's well, clear. The, the, this, <laughs> the, the, the bubble of this listenership. Sure, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm great. I'm great. Um, I miss uh, being in the White House and kind of waking up in the morning and reading the news and thinking, what is happening with that? Yeah. Uh, what does Jake Sullivan think? What yeah. does John Finer think? It's no longer exactly the same, but it's fun to kind of be on a new adventure. Well, what people may not know, because everybody focuses on your very successful tenure as White House press secretary, um, is that before you were delivering sake bombs to Peter Ducey in the White House briefing room, you were tangling with Matt Lee as the State Department spokeswoman. Yes. Uh, uh, and Arshad Mohammed. Yes. To me, that was the highlight of, of your, your that career. Was, this I mean, does it, kind yeah. of remind me of <laughs> the amount of time we would talk on the phone uh, yes. during the day when I was there, and you were the Deputy National Security Advisor, and I would call you, talk about what we were going to say from the briefing, and we'd be shooting the shit about all sorts of foreign policy stuff, and then I'd say, okay, I, got, I have to actually go do the briefing now. Brief, yeah. I have to go yeah. do the briefing now. So... Uh, yeah, that was that is the best job in Washington, it's, I will say. Yeah, and you got to globe trot with John Kerry. You get to yeah. I got to globe trot with John Kerry. Um, that was fun. Traveled, I think, more than six hundred thousand miles. Went to Paris twenty five times. Also Saudi Arabia a dozen times. So there's mm. a little bit of everything yeah, for yeah. everybody in there. Yeah. Well, uh, John Kerry, you know, left a piece of his heart in Paris. So. <laughs> he did. It's still there. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> it's still there. He used to come and knock on our doors at midnight and say, "I I want to go out and get a meal. You know, I want to go out and." See See that city. So I remember when he gave, were you there when he gave a whole speech in French? Um, oh yes. Yeah, yeah. I certainly was. Which is like probably not. I mean, something he would have done for his presidential run. Right. But, uh, if people yeah. thought that he was <laughs> in that job to run for president, they didn't see him with his arugula salad speaking French fluently in yes. lovely French rest- French restaurants. Yeah. But if there's a guy that you want to to take you out to dinner in Paris, uh, start with John Kerry. Um, we are going to start with some very good news. Um, Brittany Griner is home uh, back in the United States. Uh, She was exchanged uh, on a tarmac in Abu Dhabi uh, on uh, the early morning hours of Thursday. That was quite a video, wasn't it? It was like weird. It was kind of Bridge of Spies-y, yeah. you know. <laughs> like, yes. like, you know. Um, and the fact that it's the Emirates kind of lends this right. intrigue Drama. to Drama. Right? Felt a little cloudy or something, yes. It, it Yeah. It, it, Victor Boot, uh, who she was exchanged for, uh, is a Russian arms dealer nicknamed the Merchant of Death. It's never a nickname that, that at least not one that I seek out. Um, he's somebody who's been of extreme interest to Vladimir Putin, the Russian government, uh, obviously one of the world's, if not the world's most prominent arms dealer back in his day. Um, also some of the vast knowledge of where there are caches of weapons everywhere. There, he may have some some practical knowledge that are of use to the Russians. Maybe some ties to the intel community? Yeah, maybe just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, uh, let's just say that I don't think you're a hugely successful Russian arms dealer without knowing some people in the yeah. intelligence. <laughs> Close to Putin. <laughs> um, 
the the you know downside was that uh, Paul Whelan, who's also been designated as wrongfully detained by the U.S. former Marine, um, it was not part of this exchange. He remains imprisoned uh, in uh, Russia. Um, basically, the reporting we saw on this gen was that the Russians have categorized him as a spy, which they didn't, uh, Brittany Griner, and so therefore were asking for too high a price, uh, apparently, for, for the Biden administration to uh, to exchange for at this moment. Uh, a bit on the reaction, then I'll come to you, Jen. The, um, you know, there were some people trying to take credit to this. Uh, I saw the uh, friend of the pod, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, <laughs> highlighted his leading How role. How close to a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> highlighted his leading role in the mediation efforts with uh, UAE President Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, uh, it is clear that they have... There is some behind the scenes. Go- they're one of the few places that has good relations, or a good's probably a strong word, has, let's say, very robust working relations with both Russia and the U.S. They were behind uh, or involved in a complex swap of hundreds of prisoners uh, held by Russia and Ukraine a few weeks ago. The White House, though, denied this and said that this was a deal between the U.S. and Russia and the U.A. was kind of a venue for this exchange to happen. Now, the Republicans, uh, rather than celebrating uh, one of our greatest uh, uh, female athletes being home and reunited with her wife, Kevin McCarthy said, this is a gift to Vladimir Putin and it endangers American lives. And he added that leaving Paul Whelan behind is unconscionable, which there's a lack of internal logic there because we would have had to give up more people right. for Paul Whelan. Mm-hmm. Um, John Bolton, another friend of the pod, said that <laughs> Good must have. Uh, terrorists in rogue states all around the world will take note of this and it endangers other Americans in the future. And there was a little more uh, mm-hmm. Republican response from that vein. But Jen, um, just to start with the, your reaction, what was it? I mean- do you remember when you learned that Brittany Griner was detained? I mean, you yeah. were press secretary. So what was that like? And how did you think about that at the time? Well, I mean, it was back in February, right? And things were not great um, yeah. at that time. And certainly the U.S. relationship with Russia was already bad at that time. And as, spe- as things started progressing and getting worse in Ukraine and Putin and the Russians became seemingly crazier and crazier and more like they were losing and losing, yeah, it felt um, not desperate, but a little bit like... I don't know. Are we going to get her out? Right. Is she going to get out? Um, That's not uncommon, as you know, to feel that way. But um, it it felt um, the hope of getting her out, I would say, was not high. Not a foregone conclusion. Not a foregone conclusion. Right. Um, Because what we we, remember, we didn't even have a military conversation with the Russians for a period of time. Right. Um, So how were we going to get um, Brittany Griner out of, of Russia? There was a decision, of course, to basically make clear publicly that she was um, being detained and not held in a way that was legal. Yeah. Um, that's a big decision by government. But I was when when the news came out um, last week, I was thinking, one, those are the best days in the White House, right? Yeah. Because this it is, is just like yeah. pure joy, happiness. There's so much anticipation, stress. I read a report, and I don't know if this is true, that CBS had some of the news ahead of time and they had to get them to hold it. So that would have been a case where you or I yeah. or some other combination of people would have had to call the president of CBS, right, and ask yeah. them to do that. That's what you're so nervous about leading up to those announcements. Just something screwing it up. Something yeah. could screw it up, right? And until the person is in safe airspace, you don't really know. So yeah. uh, I I was thinking of uh, my former colleagues there and just kind of that breath of relief, lack of sleep uh, when they knew that she was safe. At the time, I remember, like, well, when I was in government, I remember there's always this balance between there, there are usually people who are supporters of the person detained yeah. who want you to be very vocal on their behalf. Yes. And then there's usually the people who are trying to get that person out in the government who are like, don't raise don't the profile. Anything. Don't say yeah. anything about this because raising her profile may raise the price that Putin yeah. is asking for. Uh, how did you guys wrestle with that? You were at the podium, I'm sure, getting asked about this. There were yeah. people criticizing Biden for not talking about it more. Yes. I understood at the time it was like, well... These guys probably don't want to talk about it more because they want to put a bigger target on her. But how did you navigate that? Um, That is most of the time, right, is uh, policy experts, people who are actually working on the negotiations saying to you, and they certainly did in this case, say very little, right? We, in order to um, make progress on getting her released, we needed to be quiet. That was the case here. Even though I left six months ago, I'm pretty certain that continued yeah, to be the case yeah. because of how they behaved. And that is almost always the case. Now, what's so hard is that most public servants I know and probably you know are, you know, wear their hearts on their sleeve. Yeah. And 
you have to go up. And I remember at the State Department feeling this way every day. People would ask. And back then, I remember Jason Rezaian, um, the journalist, Washington Post journalist, being detained. His wife had been detained with him. He was in Evan prison. The whole thing was heartbreaking. And the only thing we could say was... Uh, We're doing everything we can to get him out, which is typically the frame of what you can say. And the reason is because the more you say, the higher their price could be, the more at risk you could put any deals or negotiations. Uh, But it's really unsatisfying and heartbreaking. And family members feel heartbroken by it, too, from the outside. When the government is saying very little, their assumption is that nothing is happening. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it and it now we're in this kind of place where, on the one hand, We've seen uh, in the last decade a recent estimate that there's been a 175 percent increase yeah. in Americans being wrongfully detained, and and a lot of that, most of it, is in places like Iran, China, Venezuela, Syria, Russia, you know, places that don't like us, and we're in this kind of weird loop where um, the, this is increasing, and. and and you're conflicted because giving up a guy like Victor Boot is is a high price. Or he's a creep, as, yeah. Will, as Bill Burns called him. He's a creep, him. as you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yet, like you, you need to get people home. Yeah. Um, and, and the world is what it is. Yeah. And we don't pay ransoms here, so we end up with prisoner exchanges and swaps. I mean, um, how did you? How have your views of this issue? Of, we've dealt with so many yeah. of these cases over the years. Like, how do you think about the the choices that presidents ultimately have to make about whether and how to get people home? I mean, probably some of the more difficult decisions presidents have to make, maybe aside from going to war or using military force, because every deal is imperfect, Yeah, right? They're all imperfect. Uh, And to get uh, Brittany Griner home, you had to give up the merchant of death, right? Yeah. Um, Now, granted, he only had six years left uh, on his... um, on his uh, the time he was supposed to serve. So I don't know that it was as crazy as the Republicans no, conveyed. Yeah. You weigh those things, too. If he was in the first year of his sentence, yeah. I, I don't think they would have released they, him. They yeah. probably yeah. would not have. Um, but every decision and every deal, y- you make a calculus, right, yeah. that there's going to be something messy about it. And also in this case, they, of course, made the deal uh, that that didn't include Paul Whelan because there wasn't a deal to be made with Paul Whelan. Yeah. Um, so that's difficult. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, and I think, you know, I and y- you as well have had the benefit of getting to know a little bit or knowing the stories of some of the family members and people. These are human beings, right? An imperfect deal still means Brittany Griner is home with her family, right? Yeah. It still means, and I guess we'll see, that there is some channel for bringing an American home. And there was because we saw Trevor Reed come home too this yeah. summer. We'll see. Um, but, yeah, you know it's going to be a messy day in a yeah. White House or a State Department or the national security team when these uh, deals are announced because there's something you're giving up for it. Yeah. No, and, and, and it, it should be noted that if we were just giving up everything, we, Paul Whelan would be home. There's clear, of course. There's clearly lines that the Biden people won't cross. Well, Putin did indicate that there would be an ongoing channel on prisoners. Uh, the war in Ukraine, on the other hand, uh, he kind of gave a gloomy summary um, uh, about this is going to be a long term thing, like n- no end in sight, essentially was the, the line from Putin. Uh, an article that you know caught my attention, Jen, was uh, about these additional U.S. troops that yeah. are be- being sent into Ukraine. Before anybody freaks out, no, these are not being sent to fight Russians, but rather because of the volume of weapons that are going in and because of the complexity of some of those weapons that include you know, air defense systems mm-hmm. and drones, that the kind of contingent of, you know, defense personnel, defense attache office at the uh, Kiev embassy is going to be beefed up a bit. Yeah. Um, This takes place amidst an incoming Republican House majority that has vowed to, you know, conduct more vigorous oversight of Ukraine spending, has Mm -hmm. said there's no blank check uh, in Kevin McCarthy's words for Ukraine. Um, What do you anticipate in this space of like the oversight of the weapons we're providing and, and how the Biden team is going to be dealing with a potentially adversarial house. Well, not potentially. But on, on <laughs> for U- sure. Hey, for definitely a guaranteed adversarial. adversarial. On Ukraine, we just don't know how adversarial. Yeah. It's not Hunter Biden, but yes. it's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think um, a couple things are true. I mean, one is 
the U.S. has provided historic amounts of assistance in the last year to Ukraine. Also, it's happened so quickly that there's no way that there weren't weapons that were left, that are, were left behind, that yeah. should be tracked. That's um, obviously something that should happen anyway. Um, it's also true that public support has decreased yeah. uh, by a lot, actually, for continuing to provide support to Ukraine. It, and the Biden administration is still going to want to do it. I mean, the president yeah. will still want to do it. And if the U.S. doesn't do it, it's going to be hard to keep Europeans and others doing it. So hence a challenge. But Kevin McCarthy and like the the crazy wing of his party. Yeah. One of the things one of the hills they have decided they want to die on is assistance to Ukraine. Right. Yeah. And you already saw this play out a little bit in the fall where Kevin McCarthy kind of said, we're not going to do any more of that or whatever his quote was. And Mike McCall said, yes, we are. Yeah. Right. And so that is setting up to be a conflict. But the oversight thing, oversight is what I think the Biden administration, people sitting there in the White House and my old job, your old job are um, focused thinking about. Right. Yeah. Not just on Ukraine, but on Afghanistan, on a range of issues that were hugely difficult, complex foreign policy issues that the Biden White House had to deal with. And the Republicans are going to look for places to kind of poke at them and and find cracks in the in the sand. In. Yeah. Well, as we experienced on matters like, you know, Benghazi, the, the complex foreign policy challenges in the fog of war don't translate well into Republican oversight. <laughs> but I think it's important to separate out, um, you know, there, there are legitimate policy questions, right? Yes. So, so, so the, 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 on Ukraine, sending some more people actually, I think is a, an appropriate way of saying, we do want to make sure that if we're providing tens of billions of dollars in weapons, yeah. that we have better oversight into where those are going. And there's an accounting mechanism and there's proposals in Congress for, you know, some kind of inspector general yeah. review, like that all seems appropriate to me. Totally. Because you know, it also might help them make a case to the public. Hey, we're, we're taking very seriously like the- How you know, we're tracking how we're it. Tracking yes. It. Yeah. yes. But then the nonsense is Marjorie Taylor Greene standing up in front of the audience saying, like, not one more dime for Ukraine, Correct. send it to the wall, uh, use the money for Ukraine to build a wall. You know? Yeah, which is crazy. I mean- that's exactly. Like, first of all, the Biden administration was always going to want to track and take steps on oversight, yeah. right? Yeah, they weren't trying like, to give away weapons. Please. To, yeah, yeah, right. And that's that's kind of what a responsible government does, right? And the Marjorie Taylor Greene wing that is going to suggest that giving money to Ukraine, contributing, to, continuing to help Ukraine fight against Russia is a waste. Uh, that's going to be a louder and louder voice, right, yeah. in the Republican Party. And they're now, even if it's a tiny majority, it is a tiny majority. That's going to be something the Biden administration is obviously going to have to deal with. So politically, um, how much on the oversight piece do you stand back and say, these people are crazy. They're trying to distract you from the problems that you actually care about to do these investigations into yeah. Hunter Biden and Afghanistan and the rest of it. Versus how much do you have to take it seriously and, you know, you know, provide all these, you know, witnesses and documents about Afghanistan two years ago? Like, what is that balance between calling out what they're doing? Yeah. And and I because I don't I wrestle with this myself. Like, yeah. I, I look back on, say, Benghazi and part of me thinks like, well, one, we should have called it out more aggressively yes. at the outset. And two, we should have just given them everything right away. You yeah. Because because like the drip, drip, drip of is like terrible. The, the drama of uh, like, yeah. you know, three years later, like we found Hillary's email server, you know, like not that we even actually tell you the truth. I didn't know about Hillary's email server. The but, same. But like, Hard same. Yeah. Yeah. I, anyway, I, where do you stand on these questions of like uh, tactics, you know? I think this is the the biggest lesson is that you have to call out the BS early, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you're legitimizing it. And yeah. I actually think this is going to be harder for the Biden White House and the administration than people may think, because Democrats, a lot of them, they are kind of nerdy, play by the rules people. This yeah. is like one of the reasons I think it's like such an endearing yeah. group of humans and people. Mm. And if you treat everything like it's on the level, you are legitimizing it now. But I so I think they need to call out these sham investigations, these sham lawsuits, which we're seeing happen around the country. They're not really doing that yet. And they need to start doing it. At the same time, you can't assume that just because there's um, information traveling in crazy right wings, um, you don't need to combat it. I mean, they need to have and I think they will 
preparation to fact check, put out details, dump information, as you said. And like you said, I would just get it all out. It's going to be such a noisy first six months of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of chaos that theory. Yeah. It's better to get it out than to drip, drip, drip with it, for sure. So it's also like a presidential cycle that will be starting. And yeah. we know that another issue that always, like, travel strangely in American politics is Iran. Yeah. You know, we're at a pretty delicate moment here. Obviously, everybody is supportive of the protesters. Can I ask you, are you surprised the protesters have lasted as long as they have since we've seen protests, I mean, over different times, but they seem to be... I, I was at first, yeah, like I, because there's been a rhythm to these things yeah. in the past where there's some protest and then they build and then there's a kind of pretty vicious crackdown yeah. and then they, they hang on, but they kind of get smaller. Yeah. Th- this started, this grew, and wh- when it stopped surprising me is when you saw that this was, like, not about just politics. Yeah. Like, the, this is about the entire society. You yeah. Know, this is, like, so this isn't just, like, people are pissed about the budget or yeah. people are pissed about one election yeah. that got thrown. These are people who are, like, just fed up with the whole They're pissed structure at everything. of Iranian yeah. society, yeah. particularly how women are treated. Yeah. And, and, and so I don't know how you put that back in a box. You yeah. Know? But meanwhile, these people have dramatically accelerated their nuclear program. Yeah. And the, the nuclear deal is you're probably not going to make a nuclear deal with people in the middle midst of this kind of crackdown. And and and, and the Supreme Leader's the Supreme not, leader a, not a spring chicken. Let's just say that he's not in like you know, tip-top health here. <laughs> yeah. So this the volatility of this issue for the next couple of years and how that interacts with like American politics, right? Let's say yeah. the Iranians are dashing out to get a nuclear weapon. Yeah. You know, this could be one to watch, right? Totally. I mean, it's interesting because in some ways it's been a little bit of a back burner issue, at least in the public, right? Not not for you and probably listeners, yeah, yeah. but for the last year, it could become a huge front and center issue for all the reasons you said, uh, because there's going to be decisions the Biden administration has to make, right? If there's no path forward on a deal, yeah. never mind. I mean, the Russians and the Chinese are also two members of the P5 plus one. So there's also that. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, if the Supreme Leader is not doing well in health, if there's no incentive for uh, leadership in Iran to engage with the West, like what happens there? Yeah. The, you, always, you know, the, the talking point, but it's also true, right, is always that, you know, options remain on the table. Options are like military action. Is the U.S. going to do that? So there's a lot of things that could really come into play in the next year or so that are big decisions for Joe Biden, um, big decisions for, you know, responsible members of the global community. Um, Iran could become a big front and center place. Yeah, it's something to watch because there's just not, I mean, to use the the Diplo speak, but there's not no good option. Off, or off ramps. <laughs> no real off ramps. No off ramps inside. You got, yeah. you know, their, their nuclear program expanding, their society imploding, their leader on his last legs. They're pouring weapons into Ukraine on the Russians' yeah. behalf. So this could almost kind of become an appendage of that war. Um, yeah. It, it, it does worry me. Um, but on the affirmative side, um, what is happening here in Washington uh, and and may not be getting the, the coverage, but it will here on Pods of the World uh, to reach you. But uh, President Biden is hosting the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. Um, this is a really good thing. It's basically yeah. uh, President Biden has invited all of the leaders from the African continent um, to the White House, to the, to the U.S. for a series of meetings this week. Uh, he's taken, you know, clearly one of the things they're trying to address is how the Africans feel left out of the mm-hmm. international system, right? And so sometimes the U.S. calls up and lobbies these countries to to vote for us and some yeah. U.N. resolution on Ukraine, but they feel like, well, we're, we don't have seats at these tables. So uh, as part of this, uh, Biden has announced his support for the African Union, which is the kind of umbrella organization for Africa, to join the G20 permanently mm-hmm. uh, and to have a greater stake in institutions like the IMF. That's all to the good. You know, they're emphasizing, uh, which echoes from the Obama administration, like the economic potential. Yeah. There's going to be a bunch of business deals between African countries and American companies. Um, there's going to be a lot of focus on food in the global uh, food crisis because of Ukraine, uh, climate, uh, and the potential to help Africa develop clean energy sources. Um, a backdrop to all this is China and Russia, right? Yeah. So, so we've talked on this show, Jen, about um, a bit about you know how on the Russian side there's some ugliness with like the Wagner Group and some yeah you know, the Russian mercenaries like running cobalt mines and DRC and places like yeah. that. But the bigger thing I think is China really flexing has spent a lot of time, money, and effort down there. Um, you and I were talking about this like. Give us some of that texture, because Africa increasingly 
has felt like it's being courted by various... Yeah, said, don't you know. hate the player, hate <laughs> yeah, the game. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, look, I mean, Africa, um, and, and you you saw some of the leaders or people from um, different think tanks say this, is basically that African leaders feel like they're a problem to solve and not an opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, but Russia and China, in different ways, see Africa as an opportunity. And the United States has, in fits and starts, I will say, over the course of the last few decades, seen yeah. it as well. I mean, obviously, it was a huge priority for President Obama. We were both there for that. But now what's challenging is the African leaders are coming. This is a great thing the Biden administration is doing, as you said. Um, and they're whining and dining them and hosting them, and they'll be announcing deals and things. But what it made me think about and what we were just talking about is when I used to travel with John Kerry, or jet setting around the world, yeah. whenever you'd go to Africa, you'd come and say, here, we have this um, deal with this company for you, or we have this aid and assistance. Now, the United States leads with, which is a good thing, requirements on human rights and accountability and yeah. things like that. And a lot of these African leaders would say, uh, OK, uh, my friends, the Chinese over here, yes. they are giving me the same money or more and there's no strings attached. So why am I going to take your deal? I'm not changing my human rights yeah. uh, rules here. And that's something people kind of miss. Right. We're, we're trying to compete with our values, which we should. Yeah. But it's challenging uh, to try to um, do that on uh, in Africa where the Chinese are just playing by a different set of rules. So. It's really good they're doing it, um, and uh, but but I think those challenges uh, still exist. Yeah, no, the the Chinese don't attach a lot of strings. Um, no, uh, you know, Macky Sall, who has the the presidency of the AU right now, he's this president of Senegal. First of all, he's kind of an interesting character because we went to Senegal. Were you on that trip in um, 2013? Uh, no. Okay. So I was at state. You were at state. Okay. I was jet setting with John Kerry. You were jet setting. Yeah. So I, I, we didn't get to, we traveled <laughs> no. a little heavier. Um, but he was like the democratic success story. Yeah. Like their civil society had mobilized yep. to make sure that the, the, the outgoing president didn't try to stick around. Well, fast forward like a decade and Mackie Saul is now the guy that, you know, people aren't sure if he's going to you know, leave office. And he said, though, he had a quote that kind of summed up what you're talking about. Uh, about the summit, he said, when we talk, we're often not listened to. Yeah. Or in any case, not with enough interest. Um, this is what we want to change and let no one tell us, no, don't work with so-and-so, just work with us. We want to work and trade with everyone. That's actually They're a pretty... Like, I'm not married. I'm dating yeah, all yeah. of you. I actually yeah. kind of respect that yeah. quote because he's basically like, number one, you got to listen to us yeah. and take us seriously. And number two, you know what? Like whether it's America or China or Russia, like we're just going to like we're going to do what's in our best interest. I think the case the Biden people have to make, and we try to do this in the Obama years, you may not like some of our stuff on democracy, um, but the Chinese actually are not really investing in your capacity. Yeah. Like they're coming in and they want your minerals. They want your resources. They want to take from you. It's kind of a colonialist. Yeah. Uh, not entirely, but it, so I don't want to like totally um, shortchange it. Some Chinese investments benefit the communities where those investments are made. But what America can do is like build up capacity in these countries. And on an issue like climate change, which I hope yeah. is a real focus, like these these countries in sub-Saharan Africa are going to have to both mitigate the effects of climate change and rapidly scale up clean energy development if we're going to survive. Because <laughs> like, yeah. if they use coal to develop, like we're not going to deal with climate yeah. change. And this can be very lucrative to them. And this can help Europe deal with its own energy crisis if like hydropower is coming yeah. into Europe from Africa. So there are ways that I think we can offer a really good deal for, for these African countries, um, you know, even if like, yeah, like we're going to you know, not want them to cancel elections, you yeah. know, <laughs> Wait, have right. coups, you know. It's like multiple things are true, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, they are, many of these leaders are looking out for their own interests, right? Which is kind of what you're supposed to do as a leader. Yeah. Um, uh, they are trying to get aid and assistance and investment from lots of places. And um, the U.S., to your point, is trying to do this in a way that's advantageous mutually, yeah. right? Uh, that sometimes is a harder pitch to make, but it is it is true and better long term. Yeah. And, and and also, like, the U.S. relationship with Africa, and this is another good thing about the summit, is that it's not just the government. It's yeah. like the African diaspora here. It's the business community. Yeah. You know, it's it's the NBA has like an African league yeah. now. Like we should be expanding in pop culture. Like th there's a much bigger relationship we can have yeah. with Africa. Sports is a part of that. And yes. uh, you notice there's a soccer tournament happening now. Um, Morocco. Cinderella. Has captured our hearts, right? Yeah. I mean, I, the, the, this is the first African team to make yeah. the semifinals of the World Cup. 
they have just slayed European empires. Yeah. Right? So they, <laughs> it's kind of they, unbelievable. So first they take out the Belgians, who yeah. were like obviously terrible in the, the Congo and other places. Then they take out the Spanish, you know, yeah. we all know about that empire. Then take out the Portuguese, uh, like, you know, who had colonies in Africa as late as yeah. the 70s. And now, tomorrow, the day this show airs, actually, they will be taking on their own former colonizers, the French. I mean, that would be to, to take out four European empires in a row. I mean, that's. I love right? the Ben Rhodesianness of this whole thing. This is how I follow sports. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, one, you love to root for the people who nobody expects to do well. Yeah. Then when there are cooler, higher level stories, like you just said, you re- root for them even more. Yeah. Um, and it kind of sports it brings the world together. It's so great. you've got we've got Morocco versus France, and then we have Croatia versus Argentina. Yeah. Do you, I mean, is there a Gen Saki favorite here now that the U.S. team is out? Well, now you've m- really made me root for Morocco. You've convinced oh, good. I've, me. I've, I've brought um, you there. I'm just going to say Croatia just because it feels like. I like those guys. Yeah. You know, it's small country. Yeah. Like they're older guys. Yeah. It, it, it's funny now that like some soccer player is like 38 and yeah. they're like, oh, he's ancient. And, and we're kind of like. Makes me feel kind of old, you know. Right. Remember when we were the people who were young bucks who were just like too yeah. young for yeah, our too jobs? Too young for our jobs. <laughs> now, now we're like. Now well, people yeah, are like, yeah. why don't you know how to use <laughs> yeah. TikTok? Like, go, I'm like, I'm yeah, trying. Yeah, go away. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Leave me alone. Yeah, Get off yeah, my lawn. Yeah. Seriously. Why, why don't these people appreciate? <laughs> um, I will say uh, that uh, of all the sports. Um, these are like good looking guys, too. I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, the, that the is players. true. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Maybe it's because they're very fit. You know, We've watched all the ga- many of the games with our very good friends, um, the Noreshes, and uh, it's very gendered to say this, but uh, m- our friend Jess and I will Google the players. It's ca- yeah, yeah. And I will share details about them. It's not always their look. Sometimes it's like their family, where they oh, grew the, up. Well, the Moroccan guy, did you see the guy who brought his mom on the field? Yes. And this is something worth watching. Uh, you know, uh, this guy, his mom, and she's got the like, Full like hijab, and but she's got like a like an iPhone around her neck, you know, like like the, yes. like anybody's old mom who like yes. just kind of is clueless about <laughs> yes. technology. And right. he's like dancing with her. It's yes, really, it's very charming. She's the flashlight still probably on <laughs> yeah. on her phone. <laughs> flashlight is definitely it's on. definitely yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. This is why everybody loves the Olympics. I mean, I am I could cry over how much I love the Olympics. Yeah, but I've it's seen a similar. You. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I just get them. Yeah. It's a similar thing, right? Where you see all these global dynamics. You see these athletes who are kind of out of the public eye. They're family members. It is like the world coming together around sports. So it's it, 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 I will tell you, it's interesting. I cry more because of like a sports, like some yeah. something about sports. Like if there's just some cheesy wind in about like the player who overcame adversity. Oh my god! And I he know. wanted to like do this for his family, uh, and and then the, I, I, for some reason I'm sitting there like crying watching this stuff. You know? I am uh, too. I just, don't know if I told you how I. I tweeted so much about the U.S. Olympic trial swimming that Katie Ledecky DM'd me because I was like such a crazy supporter. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! So, well, yeah. you uh, people don't know. I mean, you were quite the swimmer. Uh, mm, mm, I was like a mediocre, <laughs> but I do love sports and I love everything. When the Olympians came to the White House last year, I kind of like freaked. I don't get easily nervous, but that Who day I was freaked out. Who are you most excited out. to to meet? Oh, my, I just wanted to meet all, all of them. them. <laughs> yeah, 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 I met yeah, the yeah. badminton yeah. players. Like, where's the I fencer? Was, yeah, I was yeah, excited yeah. about everyone. Um, so. Oh, yes. Well, so just to, to, to round out the show here, um, listeners know that the World Cup has, a, unfortunately, like a, a darker side. And, and we've detailed or Tommy's detailed uh, on World Corrupt some of those issues. Uh, the corruption issues involving Qatar traveled a little bit this week. So we thought uh, just give you an update on that. There's like a pretty massive scandal in the European Parliament where the Belgian police uh, have arrested four people, including the vice president of the European Parliament. <laughs> now, these four were charged with corruption and money laundering. Uh, Qatar was you know, widely reported as the, the Gulf country that had been providing bribes and other gifts, I guess, uh, valued at hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of dollars. Um, so we've talked a lot about the, uh, you know, the impact of not just Qatari, but Gulf money in, in this city, in Washington. Um, uh, Good to know it's not just here, I guess, you know, but uh, good on the Belgian prosecutors for, for getting after yeah. that. Uh, it's just a reminder that uh, there's a lot of money flowing around out there, and uh, a lot of it comes from the Gulf. It's not the only place. We don't mean to, to, to single out entirely here, but I'm glad to see, like, a little more scrutiny on this generally. Yeah. Um, and then one other story we uh, wanted to flag, because this is another wild ride, uh, Peru, mm-hmm. where we covered a bit the election of, of Pedro Castillo, um, who's a leftist leader, um, kind of 
rags to, not riches, well, unless there was a little corruption there. He was a there, teacher. He, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, you know, he came from a very humble background um, and, and really like a pretty rapid fall. <laughs> he was impeached after basically it became known that he was going to try to dissolve the Peruvian Congress mm-hmm. and install an emergency government. Yeah. Basically, he knew he was going to be impeached. He was trying to get ahead of that by like dissolving the parliament yeah. and making himself impeachment proof. Actually, it sounds unfortunately a little familiar. Yeah, um, <laughs> it seems, it's kind of a little close. To <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, these things where you used to talk about these countries, and you're like, oh, oh at least it'd be we, so crazy. Yeah, How'd yeah, that even yeah, happen? It'd be crazy that that happens. Yeah. Like, you know, basically, you know, uh, we, we know what this is like. Um, so the good news, in a lot of ways, is that the the institutional framework of proving democracy held, and this this failed. Uh, he was impeached. He was actually detained. Um, uh, the attorney general there uh, put out a statement saying that he was being held for violation of the constitutional order. Uh, now Peru has its first female president, yeah, uh, Dina Boluarte, uh, and Haley. We may have to check the pronunciation. Uh, Dina Boluarte, um, who took office as president on Wednesday, she was the vice president uh, to Castillo, also uh, a leftist, uh, but the sixth president of Peru in five years. Yeah. So these they've got some work to do to kind yeah. of you know, steady stability. the ship there. Yeah, stability will probably be her her. Her objective. We'll see whether she's able to do that. I do think it speaks, Jen, to the you know, a lot. We welcomed generally uh, the uh, elevation or the victories of of a lot of left of center or left wing mm-hmm. governments in Latin America, where there's obviously deep rooted inequality and a lot of reasons for uh, ambitious uh, left of center or leftist uh, yeah. governments. The problem is always. Um, Meeting those expectations, and if you're having trouble meeting those expectations, not reverting to undemocratic right. you know, behaviors to insulate yourself from accountability. Mm-hmm. My hope is Peru can both stabilize, but then also in that neighborhood where you've got a, a really exciting left left wing president in, in Chile, in a lot yeah. of ways, Gabriel Boric, and you've got uh, in Colombia a new left uh, left wing president uh, Petro. Like we've got Lula back in Brazil. Like yeah. let's let's hope that. Peru, this can stabilize. Yeah, that yeah. this whole situation can stabilize. She yeah. called for the new president called for elections, right? Yes. Is, which is it seems like a good sign. Yeah, yes. I think you need a mandate, right? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to just govern the country. Uh, yeah. You know, when the guy who you were running mate for is, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when your um, when your former running mate has been thrown out, yeah. Yeah. Feels um, like you need that. You need that mandate. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to ask you this question. I didn't. I didn't preview this for you because uh, you talked about all the travel with Carrie. Yeah. You did a bunch of travel with us. And with Bi- Biden as well. Yeah. What were your, what are your favorite standout foreign trip memories? Oh my Is god! There a favorite foreign trip, a favorite place, a favorite thing? Yeah. Um, I always think about places I'd love to go back to, right? So on that level, Vietnam is just an amazing place. Um, just kind of the old versus new, yeah. how they're right next to each other. I also went, when I went with John Kerry, he had not been back to some of the places where he had been during the Vietnam War, like yeah. bars and restaurants. Yeah. So seeing it through his eyes was completely fascinating. Um, I mean, I went to Cuba. Um, yeah. I think yeah. that was maybe my last trip. Um and being there as much as, you know, it's been a up and down journey, I can diplomatically say yeah, with yeah, Cuba. Yeah. But, um, you know, that felt I still have pictures of kind of um, the old city and, yeah. I, you know, it just pinching yourself that you were there. Yeah. Um, but I would say my favorite thing and this didn't matter as much about the place um, was uh, when I was a spokesperson at the State Department, one of the reasons it's like the best job, one of the best jobs, is you have a seat at the table for negotiations for yeah. the most part, unless yeah. they're cut down to leader to leader. And just seeing all of that transpire, whether it was in Vienna, oftentimes in European capitals, I remember one time, um, do you remember, well, you remember, I'm certain, because we've talked about how they've kind of fabricated what actually happened uh, when we did the chemical weapons deal. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK. So when we were when we went back to Europe to do the chemical weapons deal, and I remember sitting at the table with Carrie yeah. and Wendy Sherman and all of these chemical weapons experts. And um, we were worried the Russians weren't, sta- weren't going to stay, right? Mm-hmm. They were kind of threatening to leave. And I passed a note that just said, we've heard from the press that their reporters and some of their delegation are packing their bags, right? So yeah. I passed it to- The John- Russian reporters. The Ru- yeah. Yes. Yeah. I passed it to John Kerry, who is um, not discreet in this sense, yes. right? Yeah. And he said, 
my spokesperson <laughs> over there yeah, yeah. passed me a note. Um, so, you know, even though that deal obviously fell apart and what have you, well, no, I mean, it, well, yeah, some, it, it yeah. was it was very effective. Removed in the, a lot of chemical. It weapons, removed yeah. a lot of chemical yeah. weapons. What I mean, didn't I don't want to. I don't want to overly celebrate. It didn't celebrate I the civil totally war. Totally agree with you. Yeah. But being there in those moments, it's really uh, remarkable, and yeah. I. Um, so I'll remember those too. That's actually a good reminder too of like how, um, kind of human the dynamic is in those meetings, and and also like the the way in that which the press component interacted with it. Like you mentioned Russia, I'm Medvedev before yeah. he was like a raging fascistic alcoholic like he's now <laughs> the old threat, Medvedev. threatening Medvedev. nuclear annihilation when he was like a wannabe Western. Oh, OG you know. Medvedev. Yeah, OG Medvedev. Um, he used to, to, he clearly wanted Obama to and him to have some relationship. Yeah. And so what we figured out is that instead of doing the, the pre, having, you know, you can bring the press into the beginning or the end. And if it's the beginning, it's just like the press comes in and people read talking points mm-hmm. and say, we're looking forward to a full and frank discussion and nothing happens. We st- Obama realized, I think it was actually Obama realized this, but like if you put the press, if you brought them in at the end, mm-hmm. what Obama would do, and I saw him do this a couple of times, is um, the 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 goons like Lavrov and, and, and me, frankly, mm. would all kind of have to go to the side. Yeah. And there's this moment where the two leaders are sitting there together and he would always lean over and be like, you know, it would really help me if you could say something about, like, Iran sanctions, about how, like, Iran needs to get its act yeah. together. And, and this worked a couple times. Yes. And, like, because, like, there were these things that, like, actually would have been hard to get him to agree to in, like, a formal meeting. Yeah. But then you get him to say something that is a bit further out in front and from the press. Now, of course, Obama then got in trouble because before one of these press sprays, they were talking about missile defense member, and he said, yeah. uh, Medvedev, is when he was going to leave, he's like, I will transmit that to Vladimir, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it can backfire, too. But It uh, can, but yeah. that's true. It's 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 such an important part of the whole thing, as are these relationships. I mean, the fact that Obama at the time could say that to him, yeah. right, and try to get him to do it. And Kerry, who, you know, I worked for him when he ran for president, and there was this perception of him at the time that he was completely aloof and kind of not friendly. I mean, first of all, when I interviewed with him for the job, he gave me a huge hug. And he's like a very friendly, outgoing yeah, person. Yeah. But what I saw from People him, miss that about him sometimes. People miss yeah. that about him. But diplomacy is really about politics, but in people's domestic, in people's countries, right? Yeah. And Kerry used to always talk about sometimes to break the ice people's their elections the political challenges yeah. they were having because even though they're different in different countries um you know he could relate to that and sometimes break the ice with them about why it was hard for them to speak publicly about something or make a particular decision yeah it's occurs to me like talking to you, you've got this unique i mean who else had traveled with barack obama john Kerry, and joe biden like this the last few years uh can I all different cats? Is probably uh, <laughs> what's your diplomatic answer to what how a Biden trip is different than an Obama trip uh, is different than a Kerry trip? Oh man, okay. First of all, a Kerry trip, and any reporter who traveled with us at the time would say this too. You never knew how long you'd be gone. Yeah, this is the thing. Because, oh, you guys would leave, and we'd never know when you're coming right, back. Right, yeah, because yeah. the State Department it's such a smaller footprint, yeah. meaning fewer people than when you travel with the president. So, you know, you have the plane as this, as the secretary of state. And he would say, we're going to stay two more days. We're going to stay three more days. I started packing like extra socks and underwear, not to overcare, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but because you just didn't know. Yeah. Um, he was also somebody who had a tirelessness of him, about him. Obama and Biden have this in different ways. Otherwise, you couldn't be president. But Kerry I know would what you mean, stay though. up. He'd until... have dinner with someone for six hours yes. and then come back to the hotel and want to like talk at two in the morning. Yes, right? want to kind not of that Obama, go through but, his yeah. speech at two in the morning. Yeah, it was yeah. this tirelessness about him um, and relentlessness about yeah. him. Um, and Obama trip, I mean, you know, it, as president, it, it's pretty regimented, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But he also was willing to um, buck the model of what had always been done and try new things, right? And willing to take risks in a different way. Um, yeah, we. Uh, my favorite thing about those trips was he would, you know, he would give kind of high wire speeches or he'd yeah. do town halls with like young people in countries where that didn't happen or he'd like there'd be some like we go to a favela in, in Rio, right? Like we yeah. he got out of even though he's in the bubble, like he would try to do things to like He was open. Yeah, yeah, he to, was open yeah. to not following the same model of how every president had always done every trip and yeah. who they'd always met with, which yeah. is a huge gift. And he could pull it off. I would say Biden 
he's known a lot of these people for decades, yeah. right? In different ways. And I remember going on his first trip with him last year, a year and a half ago. It's all feels running like together. Ago, that trip that, to Europe feels like a million years ago. So long ago. Yeah. And he was just so happy because he loved <laughs> yeah, yeah, being at yeah. these international yeah. forum where he's discussing issues and he has he wants to listen to what everybody's yeah. presenting and have conversations with them and have the dinners and have the side conversations and i remember there was this theory <laughs> because he was 2 hours late or something to his press conference yeah. this is something that would not have happened with obama no. but maybe would have happened with kerry and biden um, and the reporters were texting me like, where are you? Is something happening in the United States? Like, is, has there been an attack or something? Yeah. It was really that he was just shooting the shit with Tony and Jake and uh, Toria and just talking so the, about. The, like basically the prep session became a. Like, it wasn't yeah, even a prep yeah. session. It was like they were just sharing and talking about the conversations they'd had that day. And yeah. I was like, nothing's happened. I promise yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I swear. They're, They're literally just, just catching gossiping. up. They're just gossiping, They're just yeah, gossiping yeah. about their day. Which yeah. is actually was all, all, my favorite part was usually like uh, like Obama too, like to like gossip about foreign leaders like when you get back on the plane and yeah. did you see so and so did this or mm-hmm. so and so had too much to drink at the dinner or yeah. like that stuff is fun and and I did think when I saw Biden that trip it must have been surreal he's been going to these meetings for like 40 years right cuz as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee then as vice president yeah. and how validating it must be to suddenly be the top guy totally. the you know like you you've never quite been that you know like that must have been a yeah. really interesting yeah. experience you know I I also think the thing that people don't give him credit for or doesn't get, you know, is that he is seen as this like kind of knee jerk person, but he's actually very patient with relationships and the care and feeding and kind of the sowing of the seeds that he'd done with all these European leaders, some for decades, some for less time. But I saw that so much happen in the early weeks and months of Ukraine where he would spend hours on the phone with Macron, with Zelensky, with the Germans yeah. talking and engaging. And when he goes to these summits, they all have that matters legitimate yeah. personal relationships. They actually, they, and they have like this history. Of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm very pleased to be joined by Lindsay Kagawa Kolas, who is Brittany Griner's agent and executive vice president of Wasserman Media Group and was with uh, Brittany Griner when she uh, or met her uh, when she reached uh, U.S. soil. Lindsay, thanks so much for being with us. You are so welcome. Thanks for having me, Ben. So uh, let's just start with what's in everybody's mind. How is Brittany Griner doing? Well, I think she's doing pretty well. She's sampling um, all of the cuisine that <laughs> San Antonio has to offer, things like pizza and lots of barbecue and Mexican food. So she's doing that. But she just she really seems to be doing so, so well. Um, Brittany is incredibly resilient. And, and always has been. And, you know, through this process, I, I think she's probably learned a lot and I'm excited for her to be able to share, but she just seems to be doing really well. And also, you know, credit to Spiha and the PISA reimmersion program that she's taking her time to utilize those resources. I, I'm very grateful. And she's been very open to that support, knowing that this was a big experience, right? And And you don't exactly know what to expect, but from having been around her, and having talked to her on the phone, you know, every day since she's been home, FaceTiming, she seems great. That's just wonderful news. Um, well, let's just go back in, uh, in time here. So talk a little bit about, first of all, before we get into kind of the process of how you guys dealt with the, the U.S. government, like who was in the like who was on the team here? Like uh, uh, we obviously got to know. Brittany's wife really well and just an incredibly articulate, powerful voice of her own. But, you know, who, who was kind of from the moment she got detained, um, kind of I, I always interacted with kind of families and their representatives. And, and, and I always found that there was always like a really tight knit group. Like who was kind of team Brittany Griner in this uh, this ordeal? Well, we, you know, we had the core team uh, in the first moments when it was you know, 530, 5 a.m., Pacific time when the call came in that Brittany had been detained on February 17th. So that was me, Sherelle, and Tracy from my team. So Tracy Hughes. So it started as her just core representation team. And then it pretty quickly then started to include um, our counsel. Uh, we were lucky enough for our chief legal counsel, Mike Pickles, actually practiced law and in Moscow and speaks and reads fluent Russian. So I, I don't want to call any of this process lucky, but I think we were fortunate to have someone who had actually practiced law and had experience uh, at a white collar law firm in Moscow. 
So Mike very quickly became involved. All of our folks um, in and around our talent came involved. You know, Casey Wasserman got very involved. Her team was very involved. Um, but I would say in the day to day, the core was me, Sherelle, the Russian attorneys on one side. And then that was sort of separated from the movement and building that. And that was really about our core Wasserman team that built and executed a strategy in addition to the WNBPA, which as a union came together to support this movement in really unbelievable ways. I mean, they are a model in terms of sports and activism. I think you probably know always yeah. have been. Yeah. Right. No, so the, they've yeah. Been doing yeah. this work. They just found a, a new a new thing to do it around and they did it so well and they showed up every single day and it was so critical to the work that everybody was really invested in just the end goal being Brittany needs to come home, right? Like whatever we're going to do, it ran through the lens of, is this going to help get Brittany home? And the discipline required to, to be a part of that. It was a lot. It was a lot. Cause there's a lot of people who want to tell you how things need to happen. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, there's always a tension early on in these processes where you maybe don't want to raise the profile too high because you want to see if the justice system will free you in Russia. You want to see if uh, you can work something out quietly without kind of raising awareness in ways that might make the price go up for, for, for bringing someone home. I, I could sense at the time having, you know, that you guys, you know, did let that play out and t- talk to me about the decision to, to start to kind of really raise the awareness of this, raise the pressure, start, start to press more publicly on this. Yeah, it, it was all part of phases of a strategy, right? Where we gave, it, this is a, such a unique case. So I'd love to think that we've provided some sort of a playbook for bringing more Americans home. I, I'm not sure that we did. I do think that, you know, what we did is probably pretty interesting because of the way that, that it evolved over time. And so over those 10 months, it started very quiet. Well, for weeks, it wasn't even known that she had been detained. Yeah. But part of that was because she's actually a star in Russia. You know, she'd been going in and out of Russia freely and was very well known and loved as an athlete there for you know seven, eight years at that point. So there was a hope that this could be resolved through essentially sport diplomacy and that the sanctity of sport and need for athletes to be able to travel freely was going to come through and and sort of win the day for us. You know, but then there's an invasion and then there's yeah. a war. And there's all these other factors that you you couldn't even have written it. Like you couldn't write a more difficult situation. And so it was really just continuing to move along that timeline, getting a lot of really great advice. I mean, there were a lot of advisors on this really smart people with a lot of specific experience that I never would have met or might not have ever met had it been for this experience, um, who gave so much time. People like Fiona Hill. You know, heard her on a podcast, try to get introduced. You probably know Fiona. I mean, brilliant mind. And the White House actually convened after our meeting in the Oval, a group of experts to help weigh in on how we can think about certain strategies. But getting to that point, I mean, the quiet phase just began to escalate. And I think it was just a matter of wanting to make sure that Sherelle could get a meeting and get the phone call because we just needed to be reassured that the commitment was real. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, that that pressure kind of helps the administration and the president be able to make a hard decision, you know, uh, like do an exchange. I, wh- uh, and then what kind of contact did, did Shirelle or you all have with uh, Brittany when she was in detention? Uh, you know, I remember it was a long time to get that phone call. Like, did, did, did you have any sense of how she was doing, what the conditions of her confinement were, particularly in the penal colony? Yeah, I think part of why we were able to be, let's call it patient, I I prefer to call it discipline, because this was every day, this was part of a plan. Her Russian counsel actually saw her about twice a week while she was in pretrial. So there were some spans of time where things would happen where they wouldn't get access, but it, it didn't ever go very long. So we had eyes on her pretty regularly. So while the US government was being denied access, you know, as part of all the political games that were being played, our Russian attorneys were able to see her and they were my first conversation every morning. So we had a pretty good sense of at least physically and mentally how she was doing based on them having eyes on her, them developing personal relationships with her. Um, But we still were looking for that real time voice contact. And that's where it was so important to make sure that Sherelle could finally get that to hear her wife's voice in real time. Cause we would hear stuff 
from Brittany in letters, but it might be a few days late because those letters are monitored. Sometimes they could be handed over, sometimes they couldn't, but we communicated with her via letter. Some letters were, we would mark them take back letters where her attorneys would, she would read them in the room and they would take them back. Other yeah. letters she would take to her cell and keep them. So we tried to keep her in the loop on what was happening, but also keep in mind that there were always going to be security concerns. You know, we all you know know Brittany Griner, the basketball player. We all see you know the news footage of her. Like, what do we not know about her as a person? You know, you've had this relationship with her, and what 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 do you think people need to know about like like her as a person and, and how she handled this um, as a human being in extraordinarily difficult circumstances? Well, I'm so glad that people have been able to see some of the footage that has come out because you see, you know, that that sparkle that's in Brittany and that kindness, right? And and certainly the courage to have endured this and still walk out of there with this sort of joy that all of us encounter every time we're around her. Um, when she walked off that plane and we got to see her face, that sparkle was still there. And I was so grateful for that because it is, it is so Brittany. And the stories you've heard Roger tell about her on the plane and that the first thing she does would introduce herself, right? You saw all of that energy and... And we're just so grateful that it's still there and that we got her in time because she is just an incredible human being. I mean, you saw early on in the advocacy where we wanted to make we wanted to make sure people understood this was a pay equity issue. We also wanted to really lean into emphasizing her as you know a servant and as someone who was very much focused on service and giving back, genuinely so, right? I remember her calling me and saying, hey, um, I've seen I've seen a lot of unhoused folks around Phoenix on the street. It's really hot. Is it okay if I just give them shoes? She said, "Yeah, definitely okay, but we can actually make this bigger for you." So she was driving around Phoenix, handing out shoes to people, and called just to make sure that that was okay. Definitely okay. So we just, we just helped her connect with local organizations to make that bigger. But she never did anything for attention, and I think that that's going to be how this all connects. She has always worried about making sure that people who maybe had been rendered invisible for whatever reason or who had been bullied or ignored were, were brought into the light. And, and I think that's what she's going to do now. And having gone through what she's gone through, I think a big part of that is going to be making sure that people understand that she's joy overjoyed to be home, but also heartbroken that Paul didn't come home too. And wanting to now use this platform because everything has changed for her now. Yeah. Everything has changed and she's going to have the resources and the ability and the eyeballs to help tell stories about other wrongfully detained Americans because she wants them to come home. Yeah. And so that commitment is real. We talked about it last night on FaceTime. She's been thinking about it for a really long time. Ten months. Well, look, she can make such a huge difference. I mean, and we'll have another conversation about pay equity and why arguably the world's best women's basketball player has to go to Russia to uh, to play. But uh, I uh, the last thing I'll just ask you, because I know you got to go, is just so what you mentioned helping uh, bring home wrongfully detained Americans. She's this huge platform now as a as an athlete, as an activist, as a symbol for so many people. And now as just someone who's been through this extraordinary, intense experience. Um, what I know it's early days, but like, what can you tell us about what, what's next for for Brittany? I think I'm going to let her share that. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, That's a yeah. good answer. Yeah. But no matter no matter what, though. But I think what people need to know today, yeah. because I really hope they keep paying attention. I mean, Brittany is an American hero. She was before she went. She's an Olympian. She's a champion. She's an advocate. She's an incredible human being. And people just didn't know her. And now they do. Right. And that is going to be something. And so everyone who's paid attention, who is, you know, is probably here for the politics of how did she get home? You know, how was she used as a political pawn? All that. Yes. But everything has changed for her. And because of that, everything has also changed for the WNBA. And, and I think that's really exciting and, and to wait to see what she's going to do with that and how the WNBA can utilize that visibility now. I mean, that's something to pay attention to. Yeah. Well, look, it, it's so, it's so good to have good news. Uh, it, it, I, I know how hard and emotionally taxing uh, the, that process is. Um, so it was a h agonizing 10 months, but th thanks you for all the work you did and your team. And, and obviously, uh, we're, we're all just overjoyed that, that Brittany's home. So thanks so much for joining us, Lindsay. Well, thanks for having us on. And, and thanks to everyone who wrote, who called, 
who joined in the movement, you know, obviously thanks to President Biden and the entire administration because she's not home unless he makes oh, that yeah. call. It's a tough call to make, yeah. This business is just full of really hard choices. And this was a hard thing, and we're very, very grateful. Well, you know, uh, we can't wait to see what, what she has. Uh, you know, she, she can do so much, um, and we're so glad that we have that opportunity to see what's next for Brittany. Um, so thanks, uh, and best of luck to you. Well, look, Jen, uh, this is fun, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, where can people, where should people look for you um, what, what are you here to plug? No. Oh, <laughs> I don't have anything, anything to plug. No, yeah. uh, I, I'm just plugging Tommy's new baby. Tommy's it's new baby. So yeah, exciting yeah. and so happy for them. He's going to be a great dad. Um, and and Hans he will be, be amazing great. mom. He, well, yeah, we knew that. We knew that. I think and Tommy. Also Tommy's going to be an amazing dad. Yeah. Um, no, I'll I'll be on your MSNBC and NBC channels. There you go. Look there for There you her. go. You can look yeah. for me there. Yeah. All right. But Jen, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It was great to be with you. Thanks so much to Jen uh, for. Uh, you know, riding shotgun today, uh, actually more being in the driver's seat. Um, thanks to Lindsay Colas uh, for letting us hear a little bit about how Brittany Griner is doing. Um, and thank you for listening. Uh, we'll see you next week.